It's fall, which is absolutely my favorite time of year. And as it gets cooler, I tend to get nostalgic about my life in England. Coupled with it being the spookiest month of the year, it seemed rather fitting to put together this collection of origin stories of five of Britain's creepiest creatures from British myths and legends. Before I get started, if you are a fan of tales of folklore and horror, and you enjoy my storytelling, please check out the rest of my channel and subscribe for future content. 1. The Boggart Boggarts have entered the modern consciousness through the Harry Potter stories when Harry and his schoolmates had to force the Boggarts locked in cupboards that would take the shape of the thing that you feared the most. In British folklore, Boggarts appear often in tales that date back centuries. Unlike in the world of magic, British Boggarts don't tend to hide in cupboards waiting to turn into your worst fear. However, they still instilled fear in the common folk of Britain. The Boggart is most common in the tales from the north, especially Lancashire and Yorkshire, and their legend lives on in the names of some of the places. So, in the folk tales of the north, what are Boggarts? There are different variations of Boggarts, which depend on the area and the story. In general, they are spirits who like to cause trouble and mischief for people. They can be found inside people's houses, hiding in dark places from where they emerge to scare the occupants of the house by knocking things over or causing general mayhem. It could be argued that normal house noises and the odd mouse or rat could cause the same problems. What a boggart looks like differs depending on the area and the myth attached to them. Dialect and Folklore of Northamptonshire by T. Steinberg, which was written in 1851, describes a boggart as a squat, hairy man, strong as a six-year-old horse and with arms almost as long as tackle pole. Other boggarts have been described as having more animal-like features, such as a fearsome creature the size of a calf, with long shaggy hair and eyes like saucers. It trailed a long chain after itself which made a noise like baying hounds. If you are unlucky enough to attract a boggart to your house, you are unfortunately stuck with it. This was the case for George Cheatham and his family, who lived on a farm near Boggart Hold Clough in Manchester. Their boggart lived in the family farmhouse and made life unbearable for George and his family. George decided enough was enough and packed up his belongings and family and prepared to leave. When everything was packed, the family probably felt relieved for a short while at least, until the worst happened. From inside a milk churn on the back of the cart came the voice of the boggart. Lancashire folklore tells us that the boggart is attached to the family, not the house, and so wherever George and his family went, the boggart would follow. Realizing this, the family moved back into their farmhouse. In the same area, there is said to be another boggart, who is known by the name Nutnan. Nutnan lives in an area of hazel trees and is known to let out a high-pitched scream to terrify anyone who comes near to it. There are animals that make screaming-type noises, such as foxes, but it is much more interesting to hear a boggart than a fox. Boggarts can also be found hiding in nature, which is the reason that places in Lancashire and Yorkshire are named after them. Boggart Bridge in Burnley is a well-known boggart hideout. If you cross the Boggart Bridge, you need to ensure that you have a living creature to pay your toll. If you don't have a gift for the boggart, you will have to give up your soul. It makes you wonder... How many chickens and small animals were thrown under the bridge by scared villagers in times gone by? The Yorkshire Dales is also a place known for boggarts, and a well-known place is Boggart's Roaring Holes, where a boggart or two is said to reside in the potholes, scaring unwary potholders. I should probably point out here that a pothole in the Dales is a cave system, not a dent in the road. In these potholes are said to lurk some of the evilest boggarts of all. 
the boggarts of the roaring holes will eat anyone unfortunate enough to cross them, and their furious cries can be heard echoing through the caves. Explore the caves under the Yorkshire Dales at your own risk. Whichever boggart you are unlucky enough to come across, it is best to try and get away as fast as possible. Number two, Kelpies. Standing proud at Falkirk in Scotland, the Kelpie statues are the largest statues of horses in the world. Although they are beautiful, they are representations of a myth that is popular in the British Isles. Kelpies are often represented as horses, but in folklore they are able to change their shape. In any of their forms they are spirits, which mean to harm humans who cross their path. They are found around rivers, streams and locks, and for anyone who meets one, it usually ends badly. In their equine form, the Kelpies are described in a number of different shapes and sizes. In some stories, they are gentle ponies that graze peacefully on the banks of rivers. This form is said to attract children to them, stroking them and climbing onto them. However, any child who mounts a Kelpie pony will be unable to get off, as their coats are covered with a sticky substance. Unable to escape, the children are forced to ride the Kelpies into the water, where they meet their fate. In other stories, Kelpie take the form of full-grown horses who are more powerful than any other horse. The way they look is different across Britain. Sometimes they are pure white horses who sing to lure people to them. In others, they are horses with manes made up of snakes. Whichever form they take, anyone who meets one is never seen again. For anyone not tempted by horses, the Kelpies can also take on the form of beautiful women. They use their charms to tempt young men towards them, before leading them to their death. In some stories, they are less appealing and use brute force to crush people to death using their large, hairy bodies. The stories about Kelpies are numerous, but they all end up the same. A person dragged to their death in a body of water. There is, however, a way to outsmart the Kelpies, but it is risky and hard to do. A Kelpie is controlled by their bridle, and any person who manages to grab hold of a Kelpie will be able to bend the Kelpie to their will. Their power will be over all Kelpies, so long as they keep control of one of them. There are stories of Scottish families who manage to subdue Kelpies to use them to their benefit, until the Kelpie breaks free. One Scottish tale is based on the Laird of Morphy and his captured Kelpie. Whilst under his control, he used the Kelpie to move the stones needed to build his castle, but then he made a really stupid mistake. He let the Kelpie go. Kelpies are not known for their forgiving natures, and this Kelpie was angry. As it left, it cursed the Laird's family, and all his future generations died. The curse was written into folklore as follows. Sare back and sare banes, driven the laird's o' Morphy stains. The laird o' Morphy'll never thrive, as lang's the kelpie is alive. Which translates to, sore back and sore bones, driving the lord of Morphy stones. The lord of Morphy will never thrive, as long as the kelpie is alive. It is hard to believe when you look at the stunning Falkirk kelpies that their reputation is so horrific. 3. Be Nye Be Nye is a version of the myth of the washerwoman at the ford transferred into a Celtic myth. So who or what is Be Nye? If you ever come across a woman washing bloodstained clothes in a secluded river or lock, you should probably leave, quickly. The Bean Nye is an omen of death, and the clothes she is washing belong to someone who is about to meet their end. You must pray that the clothes do not belong to you. As with all myths and legends, the story surrounding Bean Nye changed slightly depending on the area. 
But in all the stories, the Bean Nai is not someone you want to come across. A lot of stories suggest that the Bean Nai are women who died whilst in childbirth, a common fate when the stories were circulated. The poor women were unable to move into the afterlife as their tasks are not completed. Washing was left undone. Their fate is to be unable to rest until they washed clothes until the time when they would have died if childbirth had not prematurely ended their lives. The moral of the story is to always make sure your washing basket is empty. Sometimes the mean Nai will sing as she washes the blood from the clothes. The songs will be about the person whose time is up. Sad songs about the life and times of the doomed person. There is a strange and, to be frank, perverse story about the Bee Nai that is particular to the areas on the Isles of Mull and Tyree. In their versions, the Bee Nai is a woman, but she has strange elongated breasts that hang all the way down to her stomach. Because she finds they prevent her from carrying out her task, she pushes them over her shoulders so that they hang down her back like strange wigs. Her particular physical appearance is the key to surviving a meeting with B. Nye. This is where it gets weird, so buckle up. If a man, it is always a man in the stories, comes across B. Nye and she is unaware of his presence, he is able to make her submit to him by creeping up and taking one of her drooping breasts in his mouth. And it gets weirder. He then claims that he is her foster child by way of milk kinship. Once this has happened, the Bean Nye will give the man any knowledge he requires. He is able to ask who the clothes belong to. If they belong to someone he despises, he will tell her to keep washing, as they will die. If they are his clothes, he can make her stop to postpone his own death. As I said, that version is slightly creepy. A story of the Bee Nye that has links to an actual event in history is known as the Mermaid of Loch Slyn. This story is less creepy in some ways, but tragic in its own way. The story tells of a woman walking along the banks of Loch Slyn when she comes across the Bee Nye, washing bloodied clothes on a rock. Nearby are more than thirty smocks and shirts smeared with blood. The woman passes by meeting no harm, but shortly after, there is a tragic event at Fern Abbey close by, when the roof falls in, killing 36 people. In reality, Fern Abbey did collapse in 1742, causing the death of around 30 worshippers. It is not clear which came first, the legend or the real event. 4. Gwishki for the legend of the Gwishki, we must look to Wales. In British folklore, there are many myths and legends that involve large dogs, usually black and extremely dangerous. The Gwishki is one such legend. There is a chance that the Sherlock Holmes stories, The Hound of the Baskervilles, draws its inspiration from the stories of the Gwishki. The Gwishki usually lurk in the darkness on the outskirts of villages waiting for unwary travellers to come too close. There is nothing in particular that will make you a victim of the beasts. It is usually just the case that you are in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, this is where the stories around the Gwishki become possible to explain. The creatures are described as large black dogs which look like mastiffs or wolves. In the past, mastiffs were used to protect sheep flocks from predators that roam the countryside and to be capable of doing this, they had to be big. In the dark, a wandering sheep protector could look like a gwishki, especially after an ale or three. However, as a rule, these mastiffs were normal dogs, and did not have glowing red eyes and breath, capable of setting fire to trees and shrubland. So, the theory falls apart there. In his book, Welsh Folklore and Welsh Custom, Professor T. Gwynne Jones tells how his grandmother would tell the story of how one night she met a Gwishki. She was riding her horse ahead of her husband, 
but when she saw the bright red burning eyes of the Gwishki staring out at her of the darkness, her horse was spooked and she struggled to gain control. Her husband quickly rode to help her, but he said that he did not see anything or sense any danger. There was no sign of the Gwishki. Was this a legitimate sighting or an excuse for a lady who lost control of her horse? Five. The Church Grim. The story of the Church Grim is another example of folklore that is not limited to one country. They are found in the folklore of England, Sweden, and Denmark. In each legend, the Grimms are tasked with protecting churches and their graveyards. In English folklore, the Grimm usually takes on the appearance of a large black dog. As we said before, Large black dogs tend to make appearances in a lot of folklore. In the case of the Church Grimm, they are not always portrayed as the bad guy. In fact, their role is to protect the churches from anyone who is there with ill intent. If you plan on robbing or vandalizing the church, you may find yourself face to face with the snarling jaws of a Grimm. They are also on duty to protect the Christians from witches, warlocks, and the devil himself. So, unlike the others on this list, you could argue that they are only there to help. The Church Grim is, however, a symbol of impending doom. If you hear church bells suddenly chiming at midnight, especially on a stormy night, you might want to batten down the hatches as trouble is coming for someone close by. You just have to hope that that someone is not you. Grimms never leave their church, and it is said that the clergy in those churches are aware of their presence. In fact, it is said that during funerals, the priest will deliberately look for the church Grimm to confirm the fate of the deceased soul. By looking at the face of the Grimm generally high up on the church tower, the priest is able to determine whether the person they are burying is on their way to heaven or hell. Whether they pass that information on to the mourners is up for debate. But it would make for an interesting funeral if the priest sadly shook his head and said, I'm sorry, but your granny is on her way to hell. Some stories cast different animals as the Grimm. In Scandinavia especially, the Grimm is often seen as a lamb, this fits in with a Christian perspective of Jesus being the Lamb of God. In this case, the church will have a lamb buried under the main altar in the church and may appear to anyone in the church when a service is not in process. If the lamb leaves the church and ventures into the graveyard, it is seen as a bad omen and the death of a child will soon happen. So where do the stories of the Grimms come from? Superstition has always played a large part in the lives of people. And during the 19th century, it was believed that when a new graveyard was opened, the first person who was laid to rest there would be destined to take on the role of the Grimm and would never find their way to eternal rest. Although this does contradict Christian teachings in some ways, it was common to bury an animal in the new graveyards first so any person buried after that would not have to serve as the Grimm. Sometimes the animal was presented as a sacrifice, and other times it was buried alive. Sacrifices are, in general, frowned upon on church grounds. The burial usually involved large black dogs. But sometimes the animal would be a lamb, a pig, a horse, or a bird such as a raven or a rook. Grimms have made appearances in modern culture. One example would be in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, where Sirius Black's character is portrayed as a Grimm when in his dog form. J.K. Rowling lent quite heavily on folklore and myth for the creation of some of her characters. Grimms get a bit of a rough deal as they are not really scary creatures. They are there to protect and serve the church. But how they end up there is really quite sad as they were basically forced into service by sacrifice and burial. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I know there is a ton of content out there, and I'm sincerely appreciative for you watching this right through to the end. If you enjoyed it, please go ahead and hit the like button. And if you don't already, go ahead and subscribe to my channel 
and select the notification bell so you don't miss out on any of my future uploads. Also, please leave a comment on this video and let me know what you thought of it. Comments really help with the YouTube algorithm and will really help my channel to grow. You can also let me know what type of videos you would like to see more of on this channel. That really helps me branch out into new subject matters. If you have a story you would like me to tell on this channel, please email it to me at stories at daredevil.com. If you want to support my channel even further, there are a number of ways you can do so. You can buy me a coffee via my coffee account, or simply help me out by sharing my content with anyone you might think is interested in watching it. Thanks again.